Good morning guys, good morning internet. This is EJ back once again with another narrated art time lapse for you guys. Uh, it's a digital painting, um, as we all know, as what we've witnessed so far. Um, we're doing some work in Krita, which, you know, I never ever take the time to mention the software that I use. Um, I, I might have mentioned it once or twice in videos, but not often enough. Uh, for the ones out there that wants to know what software I'm using, I'm using Krita, and it is such an awesome, awesome software because it is open source and free. Yay! It's so amazing. Uh, it is the closest software that I could find that kind of emulates like my workflow in Photoshop. There is another software that's open source out there that's also great. Uh, the software is called GIMP. But GIMP kind of has uh, different workflow setups that I wasn't used to uh, compared to Photoshop. Um, so yeah, Krita has a much more similar workflow to my old workflow in Photoshop than GIMP does. That's why I went with Krita. Um, but yeah, I fell in love with it. And the best thing about Krita is that it is designed for painters compared to GIMP, which is more designed for... Um, for photography, for photo manipulation, uh, versus Krita, which is designed for painting. So yeah, really oh, good open source software. Uh, go check it out, Krita.org. Um, anyways, the reason why I mentioned the software is because uh, this particular artwork that we're going to take a look at, um, I did this for the Krita Art Challenge. Uh, I am part of the Krita Art Group in Facebook, and every week uh, they hold weekly challenges and if I'm not wrong um, it's been a while back it's been two months since I did this piece I think um, if I'm not wrong I think it is the first time it is absolutely the first time that I had entered the weekly challenge and I got really lucky <laughs> because sometimes with my pieces you know uh, I'm like eh you know so for like the first time that I did a speed paint because this was a speed paint this was about three and a half hours of work um so yeah for a speed paint that i did i was actually very happy with it um and i've mentioned this notoriously before in other videos sometimes my speed paints are in eh, so i don't share it i don't you know do anything with it i try not to develop it because it just wasn't working you know so but for this one it worked out like from the get-go um, so yeah, it was great. Um, the prompt of the weekly challenge was by the light of the moon. And for the longest time, I could not figure out like what to do. Like I had no idea what would be a good thing to draw or to illustrate. Um, that kind of signifies that. Um, and so, yeah, I, you know, I kind of ignored the weekly challenge for like a good three or four days I think I only had like two days left or three days left before the challenge was going to be over um or maybe three days maybe I did it on a Tuesday and it was due on a Friday or something like that I don't remember very well but um yeah I'm really glad that I came up with this idea um I don't know how I came up with it uh, I think it was just an image that just came in my head eventually which is just this uh image of um a character a robot character and a little kid um that i ended up making a girl um and so it kind of has an et vibe to it the uh, lost in space vibe to it you know danger will robinson and his robot kind of relationship you know it totally has that feel to it so that was kind of like the image that kind of popped in my head, but I wasn't really sure if I wanted to pursue that image. But what I ended up doing was I, I ended up doing a Google search for um, people looking up images because that was kind of like what was in my head was people looking up, you know, as if they were looking at the moon or as if they were looking at the sky or something up there. So... I googled images of people looking up and that's kind of when the idea solidified in my head I'm like okay we'll do like a bunch of characters like looking up at the moon or something you know 
but my twist was that instead of just making it like a bunch of people you know like normal old regular thing to do look at the moon you know a bunch of people whatever i ended up making the switch to a robot because who doesn't love robots right i mean everybody loves robots so yeah so there you go um that's how i came up with the idea on what to do for by the light of the moon and i really loved that uh, my illustration um not to brag or anything but um the reason why i love it is just because it's so simple you know um and i think this is like the best example of uh my whole two-tone approach to like you know illustration to lighting um I i've been mentioning this in some of my speed paint videos how i try to cut up my illustration into two tones the light and the dark and really the reason why i do that is because after i cut up my image into those two tones um what i do is that i just put a bunch of colors on the layer you know it don't even matter like um well what matters is the value you know you can't have the colors vary too much but what i do is i take a brush and i put it in hue variation and you know i i don't really care much for what kind of colors gets put in you know as so long as there's some sort of color noise that gets put in in that layer and then what i do is i go back to the two-tone layer that i have and i make my light selection and when i make that light selection i go back to the color layer that's all kind of just messy and then i up the brightness on the light section and then i invert the selection and then i darken the parts that are not in the light uh, if that makes sense and so um this is what i do and then as soon as i do that sometimes i photo bash which in this particular case i do believe that i photo bash um when i bring in some photos i do the same thing i make a selection for the light areas and then pump up uh the brightness on the photo bash layer and then invert it and then darken the photo bash layer on the parts that's going to be dark and then as soon as I have all this like huge mess of colors, because I mean, you can see it right now. That's what I just did. I just put in a bunch of colors, not really caring what it is. You know, I'm not particular about, you know, this color is going to go to this spot or that color is going to go to that spot. It's like, I don't care. I'm just going to put it in anywhere. You know, I make a mess essentially is what I do. And here comes the photo bash part in. Uh, you see me take one of my old paintings. This is one of my old paintings, Path and Terror. I love this painting too. Um, you could see me do the same exact thing again. I make the selection for the light. I pump up the brightness. See, you see me pump up the brightness right there in that photo bash photo. Invert it, darken the part. Then put that layer into like a lower opacity, maybe like a 50% or something. And so now there's this combination of colors and photo bash information in there. Then I'm going back, putting in some more shadows. Uh, so that's what I'm doing right now. Kind of just, you know, highlight everything. And then as soon as I have all this crazy mess, you know, because that's pretty much what I do at the very beginning is that I just do like this crazy mess. As soon as I have all this crazy mess set and done, that's when I take my blending brush. I love the blending brush. Uh, the blending textured smudge textured brush uh, the names change um, when it went to like creative 4.0 before it was like a uh, smudge textured and then when creative 4 came along I couldn't find smudge textured anymore but then I found like a similar brush so I don't know if it's the same brush but then they rename it or if it's a totally different brush that has the same um, the same uh, abilities as the smudge textured. I'm not really sure. Um, but either way, uh, I found it. And so, yeah, uh, what I do is uh, I take that blending brush, a blending texture brush, and basically take that soup of messy colors and kind of just smudge them into recognizable shapes. 
uh, which is what I'm doing right now. And as soon as I'm done with this, um, then the resulting image, the resulting uh, base, base paint is what I've been calling it. And that's what I would end up working on um, for the rest of the illustration. This is that's the one where I build up all the details and and whatnot. So yeah. So I am doing this whole hue shift thing right here. Um, I haven't finished smudging yet. Um, I thought that I finished the smudging before I did the hue shift, but it turns out that I did the hue shift before I finished smudging. And the reason for the hue shift was because um, they were all like a bluish tone. Uh, the background is already blue because uh, it's nighttime, and I kind of wanted to pop out the foreground um, from the background. So instead of going with that blue hue that it has, I ended, ended up with this reddish green hue. Now it did kind of make this whole side effect of of changing the idea of the moon. Like there's part of me that sometimes thinks that whenever I look at this photo, they're not really looking up at the moon, they're really looking at a lamplight. Because that yellowish greenish hue kind of gives off the vibe that it, that it's an artificial light instead of a natural light. But either way, I still think the image in itself is arresting. You know, it's... Uh, I don't know if arresting is a perfect word to describe it, but it's, it's definitely like eye-capturing, you know. Because when you have these two characters looking up outside of the frame of the image, it kind of makes you wonder what are they looking up at, you know? So, I mean, the title of the piece, By the Light of the Moon, kind of gives them an kind of gives the viewer an indication that, hey, they might be looking at the moon. Okay, yeah, we get that. So that's why they're looking up, you know? Um, but again, as I've mentioned, the whole yellowish tone kind of makes it look like maybe they're looking up at the lamplight, you know. So, um, anyways, my whole point in that conversation is that um, I needed them to pop out of the background, but it kind of, you know, but my the way I solved that problem kind of has this net effect of making it look like they're not looking at the moon. But I went ahead and just you know took that initial solution of just changing the hue because that I felt for me that that was far more important for the balance of the photo than making it look like they were looking up at the moon especially since the title in and of itself already gives the indication that they're looking at the moon so yeah but yeah so I did the hue shift and uh, I think at this point I pretty much finished the blending um, for some odd reason I did not get to finish the bottom part of the robot uh, I don't know why, uh, probably because I didn't fully detail that down that part of him. So I kind of just left it loose and not blended. Which is absolutely cool because it gives this um, 
because the photos the the photo of the floor of the original patentero illustration kind of shows through so it kind of gives this whole like weird texture to the robot you know that's not very it's not really clear like what that whole area is you know but then at the same time it creates this texture that that is just really uber cool so yeah So now I've begun the detailing process, um, which, again, for the detailing part, it's pretty much just me delineating my edges, accentuating the shadows, and adding the highlights, and kind of just, you know, uh, really create a 3D form, basically. Um, another thing I wanted to mention about this whole um, smudging thing that I do, uh, I've, I've been struggling with the whole smudging thing. Because I like the idea of making a soupy mess and then building something out of it. Again, as I've mentioned, this is one of my more successful paintings, my more successful speed paints. But a lot of the ones that I uh, do this whole smudging thing, this whole make a mess and then smudge everything and then rebuild it back up. Sometimes, you know, when I do that, they're never ever really successful. Um... Sometimes I end up getting this really messy, muddy color effect, you know, and it just looks ugly, essentially. And so I'm really, really happy that in one of the Kratos updates, um, they came up with the gamut mask. And I am really happy with the gamut mask. Uh, I forgot to mention that earlier on um, because it was very clear that I was doing the gamut or using the gamut mask early on but what the gamut mask does is that it limits your color palette if you see if you look at the, the top right right now you see I have access to all the color palettes now because I'm in my detailing phase but initially in my planning phase I limited that with the gamut mask just so that I ensured that I don't pick too many colors now that sounds like a conundrum because earlier I said that I do a hue variation in my brush and I technically do. But what I but that hue variation isn't set up very high. Like it only varies like a few hues over. So if you choose green, it will you know the hue variation will shift from like yellow to blue, but it won't shift all the way to pink, which is across green, for example. You know, so that's how I set up my hue variation. So, you know, my hue variation on that brush is already set up uh, very low. And then I even limited myself with the colors by using the gamut mask to really limit my color choices, basically. And what this does is to... What the whole limiting my color choices does is to basically ensure that I don't make too many muddy colors you know which was what was happening with some of my illustrations before the gamut mask came out you know so yeah i'm really happy that it came out i'm really grateful that anna medunazova i think that is the name of the programmer who um created the 
gamut mask uh, or wrote the plugin for the gamut mask or wrote the code for the gamut mask i'm really grateful for her because i've never even thought about limiting my color palette before i kind of already suspected that i was running into muddy color issues with some of my paintings and i've been trying to figure out how to troubleshoot it you know and again you know it's i, I found a few techniques to help me with that muddy color problems you know so again the first one is limiting my hue variation and then the gamut mask limiting my color palette you know that really kind of helps um sometimes though i still end up with muddy colors just depending on the situation you know and so i kind of just had to troubleshoot myself out of that situation and it's not that muddy colors are, are bad or anything too because sometimes muddy colors can work to great effect you know but it's very tricky essentially um so yeah um yeah i'm really grateful for the gamut mask for for it being introduced to krita detailing the robot with all its baroque flourishes um, again I'm continuing my whole baroque motif um, uh, a lot of you guys have seen this throughout my videos um, time and time again I would do baroque designs and either robots or futuristic sci-fi armor or whatnot um, it's just something that I've just been really interested in. Um, and I mentioned this in one of my videos. Doing the whole Baroque design is very, very tricky. Like, it's extremely tricky. Um, like, on this one, it worked great. I absolutely think that my Baroque design on this one was awesome. But my design for the Baroque design on the Robot Cats, for example. And there's a video of it. I posted it. And, and, posted it a while back um i wasn't very happy with the results in that one um and uh, i guess the simplest way of explaining why i'm not happy with some of the designs and why i am happy with some of the designs is the way the baroque designs like shaded and drawn um it kind of wraps around the 3d area uh i mentioned this again in my other videos um the whole baroque design is so much better to do i think when you're doing 3d because baroque and the baroque flourishes i mean it wraps out or the whole swishes and circles a lot of them has to wrap around a 3d object and rendering the whole wraparound correctly is like immensely difficult so sometimes when i draw it it just looks wonky and it doesn't look like it's shaded right and you know from a from a technical point of view like it feels like what i did was correct but then it wasn't looking right so like i never been able to troubleshoot my way out of those problems you know, but then we have instances like this where the flourishes and the florals and the way it swirls and the way I rendered it works well 
with the mechanical parts of the robot you know like they all kind of just mesh well in together and blends in together and it looks like it could be an actual 3d object versus like some of the ones i've done where it's just it just does not look very successful so again this is part of the reason why i love this illustration and I, why i think this illustration is uber cool because you know my baroque design was very awesome in this one compared to some of the other ones i've attempted So this piece is pretty much almost done. Um, yeah, this piece is almost pretty much complete. So I'm really happy with it. As I've mentioned, I thought this was uh, one of my uber successful ones. So yeah, um, thank you guys for watching it with me. Thank you for watching the whole process. Um, like and subscribe, and I will see you guys at the next video. Good night.